Well, thank you for having me. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the empathy problem, which is discussed in chapter six of my book. Uh, well, looky there, it's right there for you. Uh, the Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior. And what do you know, it's just now out in paperback. So it's nice and cheap. There's no excuse for not buying it. Before I dive in, um, I would like to uh, give you an overview of my work and so we can place the empathy problem within it. I've always found it easier to follow a lecture if I have some idea of where I'm going before I get there. So uh, what's, what's the headline uh, of this lecture, really, and, and of my work in general? Well, the big headline is that moral beliefs can and likely do play an important role in the development and operation of free market societies. Now, that claim doesn't strike most normal people as being all that bold. When they hear it, they kind of say, oh, well, that, well, that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's hard to imagine a completely corrupt and immoral society doing very well. Um, and then that's about it. But social scientists in general, and economists in particular, uh, are far less likely to just accept that claim. Uh, they're much more uh, incredulous about it, and I think appropriately so. I think it's a noble instinct that they are a little reluctant to buy into that claim. And the reason why is they are naturally reluctant to be going down the road of what they would consider to be cultural chauvinism. I mean, if we're going to say that uh, moral beliefs are important or that morality is important, uh, for the development and operation of societies, then that looks dangerously close to saying, well, the societies that are doing really well are the ones that have the right moral beliefs or have enough moral vigor, and the ones that are immoral are the ones that are doing badly. And you really don't want to be someone that gets caught up in that kind of a charge. Well, turns out that ends up not being a big deal in my system. Um, turns out that in my position, uh, the set of moral values and the level of morality turn out to not matter very much, which is surprising in its own right. What really matters is how moral beliefs affect the way uh, people think about morality. Um, basically, the idea is certain kinds of moral beliefs structure the relationship between moral values that most people share, no matter what their religious views or whatnot. They structure that logical relationship between values in a way that makes it far more likely that people can be trusted by other people in their society. Since trust ends up playing an important role in the development and operation of free market society, that uh, in turn uh, is how moral beliefs affect the operation and development of society. Now, that brings us to the empathy problem, because the empathy problem is a specific phenomenon that makes it difficult for people to trust each other in the large group scenarios that are so important in uh, developing a full-fledged free market society. So that's kind of the headline. Now let me uh, get into the main content here by saying I have absolutely nothing against empathy. Okay? Um, in my view, empathy is uh, the foundation of basic decency. Uh, Gustav Gilbert, who was the psychologist who uh, advised uh, the US Army in the Nuremberg trials, seems to be onto something when he said that uh, he, he finally thought he figured out what the essence of evil was, and it was the absence of empathy. When people hear that, they say, yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Few things terrify us more than another person whom we suspect lacks empathy, and rightfully so. And empathy doesn't just keep us from doing bad things. Uh, empathy also mediates other regarding behavior. Um, in other words, it allows us to be efficient altruists. If you're in a situation and you're trying to help other people in that situation, being in tune to how they're affected by what you do will have a lot to do with where your efforts are best put. Empathy 
allows us to avoid wasting effort where it's not needed so it can be put towards where it really is needed. So empathy is a, an extremely important attribute of humans. It evolved for a good reason. So the problem with empathy isn't that empathy is bad. The problem with empathy that I'm going to argue today is that it's not enough. It's not enough to provide an adequate moral foundation for a full-fledged free market society. I'm going to argue that we need more than empathy uh, based morality for the fullest possible development of a free market society. I'm going to argue that a particular invented moral idea was likely responsible for dealing with the empathy problem uh, in a rather effective way. And that this led to a great leap forward in cultural evolution that I suspect was an important part of the story of the rise of the West. Okay, so what's coming in the rest of the lecture? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is, is stop talking about the empathy problem without having to find it. We're going to define the empathy problem next. I'm then going to explain why the empathy problem matters. I'm going to show how the empathy problem can be solved. And then we're going to discuss uh, some implications of the exercise. OK, so let's define the empathy problem. And let's do so with an example. I'm going to ask you uh, an obnoxious question. Who would you rather steal $100 from? This nice young lady or all of them? Well, the answer is obvious. Uh, we can have a philosophical debate over whether it's worse to hurt one person a great deal or hurt a great many people by a smaller amount. But at some point, there can be so many people in the second scenario that no single person has their welfare reduced by a perceptible amount. I don't know about you. I don't know what it means to have my welfare reduced by one-tenth of one cent. I just don't know. It's, it's nothing. It is zero. When we're in that kind of situation, as a practical matter, it's obvious that it's better to steal $100 from all of them than one person for whom it might make a big difference. So the empathy problem is based on a very simple insight. Often in large groups, the harm caused by a single opportunistic act is spread over so many people that there's no specific individual with whom to empathize and therefore sympathize and therefore feel guilty about having actually harmed. Um, examples of this kind of scenario are all around us. Uh, pretty soon we're going to be working on our taxes and uh, there will be people who will be sorely tempted to exaggerate a deduction on their Schedule A. Why? Well, if they exaggerated a deduction, they'll be able to get a bigger refund. So imagine a guy who's, who's toying with this idea. and If he exaggerates his deduction, his refund will be $1,000 greater than otherwise. If he believes that there's no chance of his being caught, that's a big if, but let's just go with it for a minute. If he believes that, and he also believes that wrongfulness is purely a matter of harmfulness, then he can quite correctly rationalize that he should exaggerate that deduction. Why not? It is in fact true that not a single person on the planet will be meaningfully harmed by his act. He believes that and he believes that because it's true. And you know it's true. So that's one reason why it's so easy for people to do things like cheat on their taxes. Their psychology is much more in tune to what their actions will do to other people, not to what it might do to something in principle. Now here's another example, a little more interesting example. If you divide people in countries uh, by their age, the richest people are the oldest, and the poorest people are children. This is pretty much true everywhere, and it's been true 
pretty much ever since we've ever had that kind of data. Now consider older adults who use the democratic process to take resources from children, the relatively poor, and to give it to themselves, the relatively rich, through deficit spending. I mean, seriously, how can so many people from around the world who obviously care about their children elect people to public office who promise them things at no cost to them because they'll just simply force their children and grandchildren to pay the bill? Now, in my view, this actually is not a very deep puzzle at all. It's just another example of opportunism that empathy actuated guilt is powerless to combat. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, consider a new program or an increase to an existing program. Now, if this is a program for older people, it wouldn't be put in place if it didn't benefit them in some way. Now, such a program will probably burden their children and grandchildren by a modest amount at some point in the distant future. But the amount by which it will burden them per year and the amount of time in the future involved make it so that the children probably won't even notice. So if they won't even notice, what's the problem? Well, the problem, of course, is it's never just one program. It's never just one increase. And before long, the future is now. That's the problem. When you add up all of the new programs and all of the subsequent increases to the programs, all of these little insignificant margins that really don't burden anybody that much start to add up. And it starts to become an unconscionable burden on the future generation at that point in the future that we so blithely discount in the present. So the empathy problem presents us with the ironic result that it is precisely because so little harm is done at any specific margin that so much harm is done in total. Those who are familiar with game theory know the story well. It's a social dilemma, to be specific, uh, a commons dilemma. Uh, you may have heard of uh, Garrett Hardin's famous tragedy of the commons. That's a, a very popular explication of the commons dilemma. Those of you with a background in philosophy have probably noticed the similarity of the empathy problem to uh, what philosophers call the fallacy of the heaps. The fallacy of the heaps is the idea that just because it is true that if you take one teaspoon of water out of the ocean, it does not lower the ocean's depth. It does not follow that if you take an infinite number of teaspoons out of the ocean, it won't lower the depth. This is a very common problem in large group or large number situations. Okay, now we know what the empathy problem is. Why does it matter so much? Well, the rise of mankind in general, in my view, really is a group size story. When we were limited to very small groups, we were impoverished. Humans today who are limited to small group cooperation are impoverished. So far as I know, there are no exceptions to this rule, and I don't expect to ever find any exceptions to this rule. Adam Smith made it pretty clear why this is the case. So the name of the game is to go from being able to cooperate in small groups to being able to cooperate in large groups. And the cityscape there is a perfect example of what can happen when humans are able to cooperate on a very grand scale. So every human society faces the following problem. The good life requires that we cooperate effectively in large groups. Effective cooperation in large groups is a necessary condition for enjoying the fullest gains from specialization. That's the trick. That's just Adam Smith 101. In a few minutes, I'll explain why effective large group cooperation requires being able to trust each other in large groups. But for now, let's just point out that we have a problem. And the problem is we are indisputably a small group species. The first 99.99% .99 of our evolution in our current genome form took place while living in groups rarely exceeding 80 people. 
That means then is that the kind of trust that comes naturally to us, evolved in and works well in small groups, not large groups. So group size is pretty doggone important. So let's talk about group size just a little more. In my view, the empathy problem is a daunting problem because group size matters so much. The good news is that the gains from specialization that Adam Smith talked about rise dramatically with group size. And that's the crux of Smith's argument. That's why I have Adam Smith pictured here on the left to help you remember the importance of Adam Smith as it relates to group size. The bad news is that the problem of opportunism rises dramatically with group size. On the right, I have Oliver Williamson, who is probably the world's leading expert on the effect of opportunism on transaction costs and using those insights to improve our understanding of institutions and organizations. In my view, the problem of opportunism worsens with group size for at least two reasons. First, most of the benefit from cooperating in large groups comes from enjoying the gains from specialization. That's just Adam Smith again. But specialization inevitably has the effect of localizing knowledge. Friedrich Hayek made much of the idea of localized knowledge. He argued that if you really want to get right down to it, what a price system does is solve the problem of localized knowledge across society. Well, I would argue that we have an analogous localization of knowledge problem within firms. Within any given firm, if it's a very, very large firm, there will be people whose role in that firm is so specialized that they and only they will know the specific details of what they do and how they do it. And they and only they will know the specific details of changes in circumstances that would dictate them changing their behavior in a way to take full advantage of the good things and to minimize the harm from the bad things. The larger is a firm, the more specialization there will be and the higher the proportion of such individuals in such firms. Well, when you're in a situation where nobody knows really exactly what you're doing or how you're doing it and they don't know how circumstances are changing moment to moment, such individuals are often able to engage in opportunism with essentially no chance of being caught. And I worked this out in my book, The Moral Foundation of Economic Behavior, in, in great detail. We don't have time to do it here, but the bottom line is they have what Bob Frank calls uh, golden opportunities, an opportunity to take advantage of something think, when, you, when you have every reason to believe there's no chance of being caught. Now, the second reason why opportunism worsens with group size is that our natural reluctance to behave opportunistically uh, withers with increasing group size precisely because of the empathy problem. So large group cooperation is spectacularly better than small group cooperation, but it's also much, much harder because the larger the group, the more golden opportunities there will be and the more inclined we will be to act on them uh, because of the empathy problem. Now I'd like to talk about institutions for a little bit because institutions are a very important part of the puzzle of understanding how mankind has moved from very small group existence to large group existence. Uh, that's Thorstein Veblen on the left, who's often credited as being one of the early institutionalists. John R. Commons in the middle. And then Doug North, who's on the right and uh, still alive and kicking, and uh, won a Nobel Prize in 1993 for using institutional analysis to provide much deeper insights into the study of economic history. In my view, institutions are such an important part of the story of economic history because ever more sophisticated institutions allowed us to cooperate in and across ever larger groups. Think about it for a minute. If you go anywhere in the world or consider any period in the past where humans are living in very, very small groups, you don't see a lot in the way of institutional sophistication. 
the institutions are either not necessary or they're not sustainable. There's not enough resources. But institutions could only take us so far as a species. And the reason why is that they cannot deal with golden opportunities. For us to do well, we have to cooperate in very large groups. Very large groups give us, give us the benefits of specialization, but then that causes the problem of localization of knowledge, which causes many more golden opportunities. Institutions really can't deal with golden opportunities. Why? Well, think about it for a minute. There's basically two ways that institutions deal with opportunism. The first is that they can monitor and punish opportunism. That obviously won't work for golden opportunities. By definition, nobody's going to ever find out. The second way uh, is that institutions can instantiate strict routines and procedures that leave no openings for opportunism. Now that's closer to what we normally think of when we think of institutions. And it makes a lot of sense. And it absolutely can work. There's no question about it. If you think about most of the institutions that exist, why do we choose this kind of pattern versus that kind of pattern? Well, if one of them was much easier to game, provided uh, one of the parties to the transaction with a much easier way of taking advantage of the other, that one would have been competed out of existence by the other one. So it can work, and it's a part of the story of why we have the institutions that we do, but in that kind of world where we use institutions to, in a sense, crowd out opportunism, managers will largely be monitoring bureaucrats because they will not have the discretion to act on changes in local knowledge that they alone possess. I mean, you can't have it both ways. You can't have a manager with a great deal of discretion and adaptability on the one hand, but very, very strict procedures and routines that are never deviated from on the other. Well, that's very inefficient. Anybody who's ever managed anything knows, even a very simple enterprise like a McDonald's at 10 p.m. on a Saturday night involves continuous decision making. Things are changing all the time. This is why I think, until very recently in human history, all large organizations were also bureaucratic organizations. With only institutional routines to corral opportunism, decision makers did not have the discretion or the flexibility to act on the ever-changing local knowledge that they alone possessed. So for most of human history, there's been an enormous trade-off between size on the one hand and entrepreneurship on the other. We've had very large things for a long time. Think Roman army. We've obviously had entrepreneurs for a very long time. But only very recently in human history have we had things that are very, very large and very, very entrepreneurial at the same time. Another thing we've only had until just recently in human history, is something resembling general prosperity. I don't think that's a coincidence. So in my view, for a society to really prosper, it has to have large and entrepreneurial firms, because such firms are truly the engines of rapid economic growth. Now I'd like to explain why one highly trust-dependent institution, what's known as the relational contract, is so crucial for helping large firms enjoy the benefits of having an entrepreneurial rather than bureaucratic managerial culture. Traditional contracts spell out precise actions in response to specific circumstances. Relational contracts are very different, though. Relational contracts are intentionally flexible. They don't want to be specific and precise. In the case of a firm, relational contracts give managers discretion to act on the ever-changing local knowledge that they alone possess. When all managers use this discretion solely to maximize profits, the result is a thoroughly entrepreneurial firm. No matter how large the firm is, every single decision is guided by the sole objective 
profit maximization. Think about it. This is not just a very, very large firm that has the objective of profit maximization at the very top. That's not what I'm talking about. This is a large firm for which every single distinction all the way up and down the firm's hierarchy is guided by the objective of profit maximization. Everyone from someone working on the shop floor to a middle manager to a VP to the CEO himself are always thinking about what's the best decision. Something's happened. We need to do something different. What's the thing that I should do that's in the best interest of the firm where that means, in most cases, maximize profit? That's a very different thing. That's a thoroughly entrepreneurial organism. Now, if that weren't good enough, at the same time, discretion afforded by relational contracts allows managers to engage in experimentation and innovation that was completely out of bounds in most firms through most of human history because of strict routines that were in place because firm owners feared managerial opportunism. My point is that a high trust society can support relational contracts. That, in turn, can support Schumpeterian experimentation, invention, and innovation. At the same time, if managers can trust firm owners to give them their just desserts for their creative efforts, then they will have ample incentive to be creative. Um, there's a poem that uh, I'm reminded of on this, uh, Great Heights. Uh, the, the heights by great men reached and kept were not attained by sudden flight. No, they, while their companions slept, were toiling upward through the night. It's a great poem. And um, I think it, it's an important poem if you're trying to understand what makes some societies great and prosperous and most not so. In a place like the United States, it's not unusual at all for someone who's a middle-level manager or maybe even somebody working on the shop floor to be interrupted by sleep in the middle of the night because an idea pops in their head. Their brain's obviously been working on some kind of problem at work. Now, they're not doing that because it doesn't make any difference. They're doing that because they believe it does make a difference. If people who work at firms can't trust their managers to give them their just desserts, give them their proper recognition and maybe a raise for when they solve important problems, they're not going to bother with it. Most people through most, in most societies through most of human history did not toil upward through the night, and they have the economic development to prove it. So trust thereby feeds the creative entrepreneurial spirit not just at the top of large firms, but throughout the entire firm, no matter how large it is. But for all of this to happen, firm owners have to deeply trust managers because the localization of knowledge that makes discretion so valuable also produces many more golden opportunities. Just think about it. There's no escaping it. If managers abuse that discretion, the firm will be ruined. So how can a society get its managers uh, to refrain from acting on golden opportunities so firm owners can trust them <clears throat> with sufficient discretion to promote the efficient use of local knowledge and to encourage entrepreneurial adaptation and creativity at the same time? The answer, in a word, is guilt. You probably didn't expect that. So let's talk a little bit for a moment about opportunism and guilt. I'm going to think about opportunism as a rational behavior. And rational behavior is mediated by expected benefits and expected costs. The benefits here are u of x, that's utility of x, so economists like to measure it, and cost is c of x. Now, if we can make decision makers feel guilty about behaving opportunistically, then what we can do is we can make that C term, the cost of opportunism, high even for golden opportunities because you can feel guilty about things that other people don't discover. 
So the name of the game then is drive up feelings of guilt for behaving opportunistically so high that the cost of opportunism exceeds the expected benefits of opportunism. That term V is meant to be net utility, so the net utility is negative. And what that means then is that if you can get people to feel guilty enough about behaving uh, opportunistically, it will be, in fact, irrational for them to behave opportunistically. So in other words, we're, we're turning the tables on the game of prisoners' dilemmas and commons' dilemmas. They're so compelling and difficult because people are doing what we don't want them to do, and it's perfectly rational for them to do it. So we have to climb into the cells of those games and actually change the payoffs by driving up the cost of that behavior. When we do that, it'll make it possible to trust uh, decision makers with sufficient discretion to employ uh, relational contracts. But there's a big problem. People feel guilty about doing things that they believe are wrong. Now let's suppose that prevailing moral beliefs hold that wrongfulness is derived solely from harmfulness. A great deal of research in uh, developmental psychology uh, indicates that an aversion to harming uh, others is very, very strong and very universal. So there's good reason to believe that our hardwired sense of moral restraint can be accurately described as harm-based moral restraint. So let's talk a little bit about uh, harm-based moral restraint. The big point here is that if wrongfulness is derived solely from harmfulness, then our hardwiring won't make many acts of opportunism feel wrong. Now why is that? Well, now we have a scary equation. I apologize, but it's not as scary as it looks. V of x comma n, that is net utility. X is a particular opportunistic act. N is the number of people in the group. There's an absolute value operator uh, right there and there, and everything in there is the sum of terms. Now what is, what is this sum? Well, that's adding up the cost of behaving opportunistically based on feeling badly about harming person one, person two, person three, dot, 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 of the person n. You add up all the guilt associated with harming each one of those people, that's going to be the total cost to you in terms of guilt of behaving opportunistically. All right? So that, that's the macro sense of the equation. Now let's zoom in on the micro sense. Uh, H of x is the total harm to the whole group from taking an opportunistic act x. E of delta u1 h of x over n, that's the expected change in utility resulting from that person's level of harm. In other words, that person's share of harm. If the harm's distributed roughly equally, then it'll be borne by that number of people. So if there's 100 people, you'll bear one one-hundredth of the cost. Theta sub 1 is how much the actor in question cares about person 1. So if theta is positive and large, the actor cares a great deal. If theta is positive and small, it doesn't care very much. Of course, theta could conceivably be negative if you hate someone and you'd like to see bad things happen to them, theta would be negative. G of x is a guilt scalar. If the reason why you feel guilty about doing certain things is because you believe they're wrong, and the reason why you believe they're wrong is because they harm people, then how guilty you feel should be proportional to how much harm you've caused them. So that's why we multiply this term by g. You don't feel very guilty about doing things that harm other people if they're barely harmed. If the only reason why you think things are wrong is that they cause harm. Okay? So that's basically the nature of harm-based moral restraint as how it builds into our model. Here's the problem. This is the empathy problem in a nutshell, right here. As n goes to infinity, in other words, as the size of the group gets bigger, which is what's going to have to happen if we're going to have a large, prosperous group. The harm per person evaporates. It essentially goes to zero. This is like when I said, I don't know what it means for me to be harmed by one-tenth of one cent. 
But when that happens, the expected change in utility for any given person, harmed by that amount, goes to zero. So the larger is the group, the more likely it is that there will be no person uh, with whom to empathize, sympathize, and therefore feel guilty about having actually harmed. This means it could be completely rational and moral for a good-hearted person to act on all golden opportunities if his moral restraint is solely harm-based in nature and the cost of the opportunism that he's engaging in can be spread over a very large group, like cheating on your taxes or taking home reams of paper from IBM. Why? Well, the reason why is the empathy problem. In large groups, total harm can be divided over so many people that no individual is perceptibly harmed. The lesson here is that trust sustained by our hardwired small group sense of harm-based moral restraint is not scalable. We can't create a high trust society by simply ramping up the psychological mechanisms that support trust in small groups. If we're going to have genuine trust in large group context, well, it'll have to come from some other kind of mechanism. And this is what I meant by saying I don't have anything against empathy. The problem isn't empathy. The problem is it's not enough. Works great in small groups. Doesn't get the job done in large groups. The empathy problem, when you think about it, is so simple. I mean, it is incredible incredibly simple, that it's hard to imagine why more has not been made of it before. Well, I have a theory. I suspect one reason that it's flown beneath the radar has to do with mathematical modeling. If you're modeling human behavior, particularly opportunism, in a mathematical way, then the larger the group over which the model applies, the smaller will be the harm per person. No question about it. But it's also ca the case that there will be that many more people over which the harm is visited. So in a mathematical model, if you aren't explicitly accounting for the nature of the psychological mechanisms involved, the amount of harm will tend to be perfectly conserved. Yeah, hardly any harm per person, but billions of them added up over. That's a problem because that's not how our brains work. In reality, given the way our brains actually work, 0 0.0001 plus 0 0.0001 does not equal 0 0.0002. In reality, 0 0.0001 plus 0 0.0001 equals zero. The reason why is the brain, when it deals with either excruciatingly large numbers, which it tends to ignore because it doesn't mean anything to it, or excruciatingly small numbers or excruciatingly small probabilities, the brain just throws them away. Why? Well, you can only juggle so much complexity in your brain. And so things that are very, very small are unlikely to be decisive in any calculation that you would make, so you tend to just ignore it. Those of you uh, who've done work in uh, behavioral economics may have heard of Kahneman and Tversky's famous results on small probabilities. When probabilities are extremely small, people basically just ignore them. And it makes perfect sense. It's only right about 99.9% .9 of the time. Well, it may be simple, but it's a devilishly difficult problem to solve. The most obvious way to solve it would be to increase moral earnestness. If people care more about being moral, they should be less willing to be opportunistic. Well, how would that work? Well, caring more about being moral means you'd feel that much more guilty about behaving opportunistically. But if the reason why you feel guilty is because you did something wrong, and the reason why you, did, you feel like you did something wrong is because somebody was harmed, and nobody's harmed, then there's no reason for you to feel guilty. Mathematically, multiplying g, no matter how big it is, times theta, no matter how big it is, is still zero if the harm is effectively zero. 
and a bunch of zeros added up is still zero. Another way to deal with the problem, it seems obvious, would be to increase a person's concern for others. If you care a lot about other people, you won't want to engage in opportunism at their expense. Why? Well, you like them. When their happiness goes down, you're less happy. But what if their happiness doesn't go down? Then how much you care about them is irrelevant. This explains an awful lot of stolen jelly beans from Easter baskets. You know, the parents don't really feel like they're hurting the kids that many. You know, that many, they don't need that many jelly beans, right? They won't even notice. I'm not saying I do that. But at any rate, uh, you can make theta as big as you want, but if you're multiplying it by a zero, it doesn't make any difference. God is always watching you. Some economists have argued that that's one reason why we have religion. Religion is efficient because it produces an ever-present monitor, and that causes people to behave more trustworthy, and then that means we have lower transaction costs, etc., etc., etc. Well, if you were doing something wrong, God always watching you would be a problem. But what if you weren't doing anything wrong in the first place? If your theory of wrongfulness is harmfulness and nobody's being harmed, why not? Many of you may have seen the movie Office Space. And in that movie, a plot is hatched whereby they're going to skim the last couple digits off of a super long number. And it's not going to hurt anybody at the margin. But add it up, it'll pile up to a lot of money. I'm quite sure that the character played by Ron Livingston wasn't that worried about the fact that God was watching him. He's like, well, come on, I'm not really hurting anybody. Inculcating something like Hillel's rule or the Golden Rule to effectuate generalized reciprocity. You hear arguments like this all the time from uh, people uh, who are into social capital theory and so on. Um, that's not going to solve the problem. Think about it for a minute. How would Hillel's rule or uh, the Golden Rule work? Well, the technique that's used is you're supposed to consider how you would feel if you were in the other person's shoes. All right. Now let's just think it through. I have an opportunity to score a thousand bucks behaving opportunistically. And if I do, it's going to hurt a bunch of other people. And you're one of them. And it's going to hurt you to the tune of one cent. Now, how would I feel if I were you? Well, I can transport my mind over there and say, well, if I was that guy, I'd say, all you got to do is take a penny from me and you get a thousand bucks. Go ahead, take the penny, right? I mean, how big of a jerk would you have to be to not be willing to throw a penny even to a total stranger if it's going to give him a thousand bucks, right? No, even trying to get generalized reciprocity out of Hillel's rule or the Golden Rule is not going to solve the problem. This is a really hard problem to solve. Well, then how is it solved? Well, I contend that the key to solving the empathy problem is not to change how moral we are, but to change how we think about morality. Specifically, we have to introduce and reinforce moral beliefs that create new neural pathways in the brain so that guilt becomes directly associated with opportunistic acts and not just their effects. I think we're genetically hardwired for the effects of our guilt, I'm sorry, the effects of our opportunism to be run through a kind of cost-benefit analysis and where that cost involves how much people are harmed. That's the way we normally think about it and that makes a lot of sense. The trick is, is to bypass that mechanism. I'm not against the mechanism. It's a great mechanism. But we need to also, like you can imagine like a programming flow chart, kind of do an end run around that system and attach feelings of guilt to the act itself. The stronger are these pathways, the more automatically one will reject opportunism. So the more likely it'll be that that person can be completely trusted. Moreover, when one repeatedly reaches the same conclusion over and over and over, 
that opportunism won't be worth the feelings of guilt that they expect to feel, the brain eventually stops wasting resources on even considering opportunistic action. There you go, an economic argument within an economic argument within an economic argument. I think this well describes uh, the moral development of most of the people in this room, this heavily populated room. Um, what sorely tempted us as children doesn't even appear on our radar screen as adults. Now obviously nothing makes for a more trustworthy uh, individual than someone who doesn't even consider opportunism in the first place, right? That's the best way to be able to trust someone. Most of your parents understood this. That's why when you were a little kid and you came home from playing with Tommy and you had these extra army soldiers stuffed in your pocket and your mom said, where'd you get the army soldiers? He said, oh, I got them from Tommy. Why did Tommy give you a bunch of army soldiers? Well, he didn't give them to me. Well, how much did you pay for them? Well, I just took them. Well, what do you mean you just took them? Mom, it's okay. He has like hundreds of them. He won't care. He won't even notice that they're gone. Now, if your mother was like my mother, she would have said, that is completely beside the point. It is still stealing. It is still wrong. It still makes you a thief. Now, turn yourself around, head right back to Tommy's house, hand him those soldiers, tell him what you did, and apologize. Now, I suspect you had mothers that would have done right. There would have been no, no quarter. Um, the more humiliated you were, the happier your mother would have been, right? Now, if you think about it, though, such rebukes serve to connect guilt to the act itself, making it feel inherently wrong. It isn't about the harm that happened to Tommy. It's about stealing, and you're not supposed to steal. Moral beliefs that give rise to such rebukes exemplify what I call principled moral restraint. Okay, so let's dive into the nitty gritty of solving the empathy problem. Again, the key, the key is to tie in voluntary feelings of guilt directly to negative moral actions. Okay, there's that scary equation again. You don't need to relive it. You can just look to the far right and you can see in red a minus G super P of X. That G super P of X term is a term to reflect what I call principled moral restraint. G is for guilt. P is for principle. X is the opportunistic act. But the key thing is, notice inside G, inside that function, there's no N. N has nothing to do with it. The act is wrong in and of itself. It doesn't matter whether you spread the harm over a million people or two people. Why? Because we've put out the effort to make sure you feel guilty about something because you believe it's inherently wrong. That's important. Because then as, infinite, as n goes to infinity, those uh, middle terms vanish, but that g super p of x term remains. So the key thing here about principal moral restraint is it has nothing to do with how much anyone is harmed, and therefore it has nothing to do with group size. It stays in play. It is not subject to the empathy problem. So one way society can get around the empathy problem is to invest heavily into moral beliefs that effectuate principled moral restraint. All right, let's talk about some implications. So how did we go from something like this to something like this? I mean, that's really the $100,000 question. In my view, we went from the impoverished small group existence of hunter-gatherers to the prosperous large group existence of modern life and free market societies by becoming ever better at cooperating in ever larger groups. That's the big fact. Inventing institutions to overcome the limitations of small group trust was huge. You can't overstate its importance. 
It allowed us to build entire civilizations. But even in these great civilizations, most people remain impoverished. Being able to trust strangers and use trust-dependent institutions, like relational contracts, allowed us to build highly creative free market societies, and those were capable of producing general prosperity. I think abstract moral ideas, like principled moral restraint, were the key to supporting cooperation in ever larger groups by increasing trust in each other. Even people we didn't know about or particularly care about. And by making trust dependent institutions like relational contracts possible. In my view, the empathy problem is just one example of the broader problem, that being the problem of moving past our small group genes. It's a big problem. The good life requires being able to cooperate in large group context, but we are indisputably a small group species. Moving past our small group genes has therefore been our greatest struggle, and to the extent that we've prevailed in that struggle, it has been our greatest achievement. Think for a minute about the great works of literature or the great works of philosophy, the great truisms of Western civilization. Many of them hearken to principles that impose upon us constraints and engender in us virtues to help us work together better with other people that we don't even know. We don't need a great deal of philosophy and training to care about our children. We do, though, need a great deal of training and thinking to care about people we don't know and to be reluctant to do any harm to them whatsoever. And we use ideas like principled moral restraint to effectuate that outcome. But moving past our small group moral intuitions does not and should not mean displacing them. The greatest horrors of mankind have resulted from clever people inventing abstract moral ideas that suppress small group ideas like empathy. Combine this with well-placed stoking of our tribal tendencies, and you can get humans to do anything to other humans. So while we are indisputably a small group species that is in some sense maladapted for creating the kinds of societies that support the good life, tamping down our small group moral intuitions is not a good idea. That's not the right way to go. A better approach to maximizing human flourishing and advancement is to address the limitations of our small group moral intuitions without throwing the baby out with the bathwater. In other words, let's leave our hardwired moral compass intact, that being our sense of empathy, but then add an additional layer of moral restraint, a layer that doesn't wither in large group contexts. This is what I think has actually been happening over the course of recorded human history. I think large group moral ideas like principled moral restraint have been producing great leaps forward in cultural evolution to support a cooperation in ever larger groups than before. Over time, more and more of Adam Smith's genie was therefore able to climb out of the bottle. But effectuating the widespread adoption of such beliefs is easier said than done. More layers of moral restraint means more required investment in moral training. That's more cost. That's more sacrifice. That's harder. It's simply harder to be a society that abides not only by small group moral beliefs, but also large group moral beliefs. And it's not just harder because more effort and investment is required. Most of our evolution took place while we were living in very small groups. As a result, psychological mechanisms that support cooperation in small group contexts have had ample reason to be reinforced through natural selection. This means that small group moral ideas like harm-based moral restraint are relatively easy to inculcate. The mind is 
already well prepared to understand them and be receptive to them. But things are very different for moral ideas that support large group cooperation, moral ideas like principle moral restraint. Through nearly all of our evolutionary history, there's been no evolutionary payoff to reinforcing psychological mechanisms that do a good job supporting cooperation in large group contexts. The reason why is obvious. We didn't live in those contexts. It was a moot point. This means we are much more inclined to teach, learn, understand, and feel strongly about small group moral ideas than large group moral ideas. That's unfortunate because the key to making general prosperity possible is large group cooperation. Of course, like anything else, resources for moral instruction are limited. So if we're biased to focus on teaching small group moral ideas because they come so naturally to us, then we are necessarily biased to spend too little time teaching large group moral ideas. I suspect that this might be part of the reason why religions have played such an important role in the development of human societies. If people sincerely believe that drumming specific moral beliefs into their children is necessary to save their souls, that might have overcome a natural bias to focus solely on small group moral intuitions. For example, if stealing is wrong, not just because it hurts people, but also because God said it's wrong, then it's wrong even if no one gets hurt. This allowed some religions, not all, some religions to get around the empathy problem and thereby make it easier for people to trust each other in large groups and therefore make it easier to cooperate with each other in large groups. Whether it was religion or something else, the widespread adoption of ideas that made uh, large group cooperation possible had Promethean effects on social, political, and economic development largely in the West. Finally, how much a society invests in moral instruction matters, but the kind of moral beliefs matter even more. This is because investing more into teaching small group moral ideas that are inimical to large group cooperation will actually lower societal success. There is simply no escaping the fact that the content of moral beliefs matters. Think about it. A hallmark of underdeveloped societies is hyper-religiosity. Clearly, the problem in such societies is not a lack of investment in moral beliefs. It is too much investment in moral beliefs that apparently don't get the job done. But incredibly, over the last century, the West has been investing less and less in large group moral ideas like principled moral restraint, while investing more and more in small group ideas like harm-based moral restraint, ideas that already come naturally to us. This betrays a shocking lack of appreciation for the success of Western culture. It suggests that our dynamic creative, high trust, free market society may be on a path to dying a death by thousand cuts. As the decay of moral beliefs that sustain trust in large groups shifts us slowly but surely away from an entrepreneurial culture to an increasingly bureaucratic one. Thank you.